Well, thank you for coming this morning. I know it can be a challenging time of year, uh, lots of exams and uh, papers that you need to prepare, but I also know it's an exciting uh, time of year because summer vacation is almost here. And a lot of you are thinking, if I can just hang on for a few more weeks, I will be fine. Um, we like summer vacation, right? Um, hopefully you do get a chance to take a vacation uh, with friends or family. Uh, I want to tell you something about uh, what happened in our last uh, family vacation last summer. We had a pretty interesting experience. Um, we got to the place um, and we had to rent a car. However, uh, the car was closely parked uh, to another one and so the license plate was blocked. Therefore, it wasn't until we got to where we were staying that we realized that our license plate had a very interesting uh, number. Uh, the one that all Christians dread. <laughs> the three numbers were yes, six, six, six. In addition to that, um, we also noticed that the letters before it were S-C-Y to which my husband uh, responded, seriously, it reads Satan's car, yo, 666. Six, six. <laughs> so there we were driving around in Satan's car for 10 days. <laughs> but we realized that the good news was that at least people would give us a lot of room on the freeway. So there were advantages to it. You know, it's so easy. Uh, to fall into thinking that the enemy's influence is going to be so obvious and easy to spot. And that would make it a lot easier, right? Um, I want to let you know that today is actually a milestone day for my husband and me. It's not our wedding anniversary, it's not the anniversary of our first date. No, the significance of today is that tonight we are finally going to watch the last episode after finishing all seven seasons of Star Trek The Next Generation. <laughs> so, so we're very excited about that, as you can see. Now, when you watch um, a show for that many times, and in case you're curious, I think it's about 175 episodes. Um, you begin to notice certain things. And one of the things we notice is that on the Enterprise, they have this really cool thing where if, an, if a ship comes towards them, they can actually tell if it's going to fire on them. So a typical scene is going to work like this. Strange ship approaches. Hmm, let's try to hail them. Hail them, no response. What should we do? And suddenly the security officer, Lieutenant Worf, says, Sir, they are powering up their weapons. And then Captain Picard says, Raise shields. Okay, and they raise their shields and then they ward off the attack. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could do the same thing? If we could say, Hey, Satan's about to attack, raise shields. Wouldn't that be really nice? It would be so easy if we could just do that. But of course, it's not always going to be that obvious. Why else would he be called the father of lies? And why else would Genesis tell us that he was the one who is more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made? The whole point is that he's not going to be obvious, and so we have to be discerning. There's an interesting story in Acts 16 that illustrates this. The first part of the story reads, as we were going to the place of prayer, Paul, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, the rest of the story you may be familiar with. The owners are very upset because they are no longer making money from her, and they have Paul thrown in prison. While Paul's in prison, there is a great earthquake. Uh, he is freed, and the jailer and his family come um, and to become believers. Now, the first part, that we tend to focus on the latter part of the story, but I want to make a point about the first part of the story here. The slave girl follows Paul saying, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now you would expect that Paul would welcome that, right? I mean, it's like free advertising. But we, set, but we read that he becomes annoyed and commands the spirit to come out of her. So why would Paul do this? Well, in Philippi, which is a Roman city, the phrase, the most high God, probably does not refer 
the God of the Old Testament. You see, there's abundance of archaeological evidence and inscriptions that attest to the worship of a, go a local God in the area known as the Most High God. And there's particularly a lot of evidence in the area in which Philippi was located. Also, the way of salvation may have reference to this God as well. The word for salvation, soteria, does not just mean salvation as we often think about it in terms of eternal life, but it can also mean in general well-being, health, rescue from hardship. There is an inscription in a city near Philippi in which there is a person praising this most high God for the health, soteria, of his patron. Okay. So in other words, the people hearing uh, the girl may have heard a reference to this pagan God, not the Christian God. And maybe that's why Paul is so concerned that she stopped talking about this. You see, sometimes things that sound good are not good. They have the appearance of being good, but at their root, they are not good because Satan can twist something or cause misunderstanding or confusion or put just enough spin on it to lead us away from God because that's what he wants to do most, to lead us away from God himself. That's why in 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul exhorts the believers, but I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What I wanted to do today was to share some of my thoughts in an area in which I think we as Christians can be particularly prone to be deceived these days and led away from that pure devotion. Simply put, our busy culture tempts us to define ourselves by doing good works rather than by God. Okay. Now I do want to mention this is not an excuse not to do your homework. <laughs> okay? Wait, she said not busy works. No. Let me say this again. Our busy culture tempts us to define ourselves by doing good works rather than by God. Now we might be able to ask what can possibly be wrong with good works? As sincere Christians, we want to do good works. We know they aren't the basis of our salvation, but we can do them for the wrong reasons. For example, in his book, Crazy Busy, Kevin DeYoung talks about the burden he felt, particularly while he was in seminary. The burden was not about all the things he was doing, but rather about all the things he could have been doing. He calls them the, this is what good Christians do, kinds of opportunities. He says, surely there are many Christians who are terribly busy because they sincerely want to be obedient to God. We hear sermons that convict us for not praying more. We read books that convince us to do more for global hunger. We talk to friends who inspire us to give more and read more and witness more. The need seems so urgent. The workers seem too few. If we don't do something, who will? We want to be involved. We want to make a difference. We want to do what's expected of us. But we don't always do good works out of obedience. Often we do them out of guilt or because that's what everyone else is doing or because we don't want to look bad. We can even do them to hide. DeYoung further points out, the presence of extreme busyness in our lives may point to a deeper problem, perhaps a pervasive people pleasing, a restless ambition, a malaise of meaninglessness. Busyness serves as a kind of existential reassurance, a hedge against emptiness, uh, writes Tim Crider in his viral article, The Busy Trap for the New York Times. Obviously, your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you are so busy, completely booked in, in demand every hour of the day. Furthermore, an article in the Huffington Post last year was titled, Being Busy as a Status Symbol, and described how being busy can signal higher status and value in our culture. Now, this doesn't mean that all of us who are busy are pursuing this status, but it can reflect how busyness has become the norm for us and even an expectation. For example, when someone asks, how are you? How many of us answer, busy? We probably are, but we also have to admit that saying we are busy sounds a lot better than saying, um, I really don't have much to do. Okay. The author describes how this is not the case in other countries, such as England, where he used to live, and where in answer to the question, how are you, they don't answer busy, but rather, good, how are you? He cites a study by a Harvard Business School doctoral student who concluded that being busy was shorthand for inferring high status. Is part of the reason we are so busy because it reflects our larger ideas of what makes us valuable? 
Being busy for the wrong reasons, though, can be disastrous. Howard Baker, in his book Soul Keeping, said, I had lost my soul to one of the chief rivals of devotion to Christ, that is, service for him. You might ask, why did this happen? How can service be so harmful? He explains, I had to admit that I was really serving my own need to be successful and appreciated. The truth, so hard to face, was that I had lost the spiritual fire because my own ambitions had been the driving force in my life rather than a love for God. Pride, that old, original, and hidden sin had directed me away from serving God into serving an image of myself buried deep under layers of religious work. We may tell ourselves that we aren't doing enough, that we need to do more, that it's not spiritual to say no to something good, and what maybe we're doing is taking ourselves out of service to the kingdom. Perhaps our reasons aren't the same as Baker's, but it may be worth examining if they are godly. Howard saw his wrongly, made, wrongly motivated service as harming his soul, and while he was trying to do good work, something very important was missing, God, and the impact was devastating to his soul. Sometimes we cannot avoid being busy, but even then are we making time to work on our souls? I remember the wise words of one of the most godly people I've ever met. Each day, I take time to nurture my soul. Do we even recognize how valuable our souls are and realize that we cannot take them for granted? And I do wanna make clear, very clear, that I'm not saying that good works are bad and that we shouldn't pursue good works. And in fact, Ephesians 2.10 tells us directly that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand for us to do. So we are, our purpose is to do good works. The problem is when we do them with the wrong motive. But what happens when we have the right motive? Let's think about that. To put it more positively, as Christians, we actually have a unique opportunity to go about tending souls. And this, I think, could even be something very valuable to show the world how Christ makes a difference. Steven Pinker, some of you may be familiar with him, he's a famous psychologist and atheist at Harvard. And he got into a discussion with another a philosopher about the role of the university in tending to the souls of the students. And here's what he said as an atheist. Perhaps I'm emblematic of everything that is wrong with elite American education but I have no idea how to get my students to build a self or become a soul. It isn't taught in graduate school, and in the hundreds of faculty appointments and promotions I have participated in, we've never evaluated a candidate on how well he or she could accomplish it. I submit that if building a self is the goal of a university education, you're going to be reading anguished articles about how the universities are failing at it for a long, long time. But think about what we're here at Biola or what we talk about as Christians. As Christians, aren't we all about souls? The problem is it's especially hard to build a soul when we're constantly doing because we always want to be moving forward, achieving, accomplishing, and acquiring more. But as Joshua Truman Kong says in his book, Deep Rooted in Christ, caring for our soul means taking a step back to have a deeper relationship with God. Or, if I can borrow a phrase from a title of a book from one of my colleagues, Klaus Isler, perhaps we need to waste some time with God, not always doing things for him, but also being with him. I know this leads to the question of whether all this focus on the soul is selfish. After all, isn't the Christian life all about sacrifice? About giving up the self to serve God and others? Certainly we can have a selfish focus on ourselves, but I think a true biblical focus on the soul will actually have the opposite effect, that a grounded soul makes us more capable of caring for others and relating with God. Yes, a focus on the self can be problematic. Two psychologists, Jean Twenge and Keith Campbell, wrote a book called The Narcissism Epidemic in which they describe what they see as a relentless rise in narcissism in our culture, which includes the emphasis upon material wealth, physical appearance, celebrity worship, and attention seeking. They define narcissism in part as an inflated view of the self, 
And in it, they argue that the increase in narcissism is the result of a massive shift in culture towards a greater focus on self-admiration. They cite an interesting statistic in which, despite the decline in American students' test scores in areas such as math and science, uh, Americans have higher narcissism scores than people from any other country. So at least in one area, we're number one. <laughs> okay. Yay, us. Yes, God has made us all unique with gifts and talents to be cherished and valued. However, another simultaneous truth of our existence is that as humans, we are limited and weak. And the irony is that we really can't develop our own soul and ourselves because that only comes from God who is the creator. Whereas our culture of busyness and narcissism tells us that we can do it on our own because we are capable, that we can build a self, scripture tells us we need to learn how to handle our weakness. To work on our souls means we have to give up the pretense that we can do it and that we are the center of the universe. For example, Romans 8.26 says that we need the Spirit to help us in our weakness and that we need Him to intercede for us. We learn in 2 Corinthians 12.9 that God's grace is sufficient for us and His power is made perfect in weakness, that Paul wants to boast of his weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon him. And isn't that where grace comes in? I am relieved of the burden of trying to prove I am something or somebody, of having to make something work. Sometimes the best place to start doing something is to realize we can't do it and we need help. Years ago, there was a show um, called Extreme Makeover Home Edition, and some of you might have watched it. And in the show, what they would do is they would find some uh, needy family, someone who needed something and couldn't afford it, and they would build a home for them or remodel their home for them. Uh, for example, one episode, uh, they built a home, or they remodeled or built a home for a, a father who had eight children, but whose wife had died you know, four years ago. They, they, they gave him a bigger home. In another episode, um, they remodeled a home for a child whose son uh, was blind and autistic and needed special safety features. The common denominator of all these people here is that they needed help and they received it. We all need help. We probably all like to give help. We may not be as good at receiving help. But the biblical way is not strength, our strength, but submission. We spend a lot of time trying to learn how to do things correctly, but do we spend the same amount of time learning what it means to be weak? How we can submit to God's working in our lives, how we can rest in God's grace, how his spirit can work through us. How can we learn radical dependence on God? Perhaps one way is to simply work on setting our hearts on the right things. There was recently a story about an ESPN reporter who was caught on a security videotape berating a worker at a tow truck company. And some of you might be familiar with the story. Apparently she's very upset at having her car towed, and on the video she says some choice things to this worker, being very upset, and she says things like, and this is the censored version, okay, that's why I have a degree and you don't. I wouldn't work at a scumbag place like this. Makes my skin crawl even being here. Uh, maybe if I was missing some teeth, they would hire me, huh? Uh, I'm on television and you're in a trailer. Uh, lose some weight, baby girl. And all this is after she was being told, she was told she was being videoed by the security camera. In his column for USA Today, Chris Chase noted, this isn't someone having a bad day. This isn't someone frustrated by an employee at a tow truck operator. We have all been there and hopefully didn't denigrate the man or woman responsible for not having a degree nor rip on a cashier for simply doing her job. What she did was an attitude based on power and entitlement. Our culture tells us to set our hearts on ourselves, but scripture points us in a very different direction, to treasure in heaven, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We know the world is filled with things that we can set our hearts on, and our culture tells us set our hearts on what we think we deserve. But when I set my heart on what I think I deserve, then I tend to be rude to the customer agent. Um, 
impatient with the cashier and grumble about the work I have to do or traffic on my way here today. Uh, what happens when we set our hearts on something? We are ultimately dedicated to it, and we seek it with everything in us, and we won't let anything get in the way. Now, we've probably all heard stories about the great lengths some dogs will go to to be reunited with their owners because they're so attached to them. Here's one newspaper account of a dog who had his heart set on staying with his owner. One loyal dog hasn't moved from his master's side for the last six years, refusing to let even death part them. German Shepherd Capitan ran away from home after his owner and best friend, Manuel Guzman, died in 2006. A week later, Guzman's family, who lives in Cordoba, Argentina, found the heartbroken dog grieving at the gravesite. We had never taken him to the cemetery, so it is a mystery how he managed to find the place, his widow told the son. Every Sunday for the last six years, the Guzman family has gone to the cemetery to visit both Manuel and Capitan. Although the dog often leaves the cemetery for a short period of time with his family, he always returns to the gravesite before dark. She says, during the day, he sometimes has a walk around the cemetery, but always rushes back to the grave. And every day at six o'clock sharp, he lies down on top of the grave and stays there all night. Proverbs 27, 19 says that the heart is central to who the person is. As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects the man. Proverbs 4.23 warns us, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. We may be busy doing things for God, but are we setting our hearts on the Lord? As A.W. Tozer says in The Pursuit of God, everything is made to center on the initial act of accepting Christ, and we are not expected thereafter to crave any further revelation of God to our souls. We have been snared in the coils of a spurious logic, which insists that if we have found him, we need no more seek him. So what drives you? Are you driven by a deep need to know God? Is your heart, my heart, our hearts set on God himself? I know it's not easy to keep this focus because our natural tendency is to see center on ourselves and see how God relates to us rather than the other way around. Let me even give you a couple of examples of how we might see this in scripture. In 1 Samuel 17, we read of the famous story of David and Goliath. It's a great story of the underdog, right? How God helps the little guy overcome great odds to defeat the one who is supposed to be much bigger and stronger. Well, that might be part of the story, but here is the real lesson. 1 Samuel 17, 45 to 47 says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Here's another example. What does Abraham do after the sacrifice of Isaac? Abraham has just gone through this huge trial. He's ready to sacrifice his own son, and at the last minute, God spares Isaac. He's ready to sacrifice Isaac, the one on whom all the promises depend. Now, when he realizes he doesn't need to sacrifice Isaac, I'm sure he's very happy about it, but what does Scripture tell us? What does Scripture seem to think that we need to know? It tells us that Abraham named the place the Lord will provide as it is said on this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The lesson there is that Abraham knew he could count on the God who provides. We tend to look horizontally to see how we compare with everyone else, but our horizontal comparisons put us at the center, and that's not a very good place to be, because there will always be someone stronger, funnier, richer, better looking, whatever, more interesting than we are. But looking vertically reminds us that we belong to a God who will deliver, a God who will provide, a God who is faithful, and so forth. But there are many things that distract our hearts, and so we must be careful and be aware. And the Old Testament tells Israel continuously to set their hearts to seek the Lord. 
as in 1 Chronicles 22, 18. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Now these words sound like good advice to us as well. Or Psalm 42, 1, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you. But we can be so busy doing things for God, even with good intentions and good results that we forget God himself. In Isaiah 23, uh, 29, 13, we're warned, people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by men. When our hearts are far from God, our lives become ruled by our own commandments rather than drawing near to the one who loves us. I like to remind myself that even Jesus didn't do everything. He didn't heal everyone. He didn't preach in every town. I'm sure he didn't talk with everyone who wanted to talk with him. And how many times did he withdraw from the crowds to pray? But Jesus spent time with the Father, and the result was he did what the Father asked him to do. He went to the cross, and he accomplished his mission. So why does this matter? We don't always recognize the ways that these thoughts, habits, and patterns impact us. And we think we're okay because we're doing good works, but we actually may be doing them without God. And we don't notice it because, after all, who can argue with doing good works, right? And Satan will try to come between God and us by using these thoughts and changing our focus. And these thoughts are not harmless. In her memoir, The Glass Castle, Jeanette Walls writes of the experience she had growing up in a dysfunctional family. One time when she was about 10, her alcoholic father took her to the zoo and snuck her in to pet a cheetah. She describes how they climbed under the chain link fence and he helped her stick her hand through the cage so she could pet the cheetah. She writes, Dad took my hand and slowly guided it to the side of the cheetah's neck. It was soft but also bristly. The cheetah turned his head and put his moist nose up against my hand. Then his big pink tongue unfolded from his mouth and he licked my hand. Dad opened my hand and held my fingers back. The cheetah licked my palm, his tongue warm and rough like sandpaper dipped in hot water. The story would become part of her family lore. Remember the time Dad let you pet the cheetah? And they would just tell it over and over again at their gatherings. Now this sounds like a pretty exciting, but also a rather foolish thing to do, right? I mean, she was very fortunate that she didn't lose a hand or worse. You know, being 10 years old, she just didn't have the discernment to think about how dangerous it was and the potentially long-term consequences of what she did. She just didn't see it. So I wonder if sometimes we're like walls, where we see the danger, she kind of saw it, we see the danger, but we don't see the danger. We all know that good works are not the end, and we all know that we shouldn't do them for bad reasons, but sometimes we fail to discern our deeper motives, ones that can spring from pride, guilt, insecurity, misplaced values, and so forth, and we don't escape the consequences. So think about this then, perhaps. Don't try to pet the cheetah. We want to do good, but in the end, the best way to do good is to look to the one who is good, because that's the way we were made. So let's pray. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.